today, uh, earlier in class, we were talking about, uh, we're doing the Sixth Patriarch uh, Sutra, and um, a lot of uh, issues came, not issues, uh, questions came up about the um, um, Nirvana. <clears throat> in the Sutra, they, you know, he talks about Nirvana, what Nirvana is, and uh, I was trying to explain that, to put it in words so we can have a understanding, a tangible understanding of Nirvana, it would be the cessation of thoughts, uh, emptiness, voidness, but not per se, not thought. There's a misunderstanding that happens, and um, myself, I, I, I went through that because of the lack of understanding. Uh, when we mistake, no mind for no thought and we all i gotta stop my thoughts well good luck mm -hmm. you know that that's sort of like a, you know like they're like a train you know it's 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 they're always gonna keep going it's a train that never ends it just keeps going and going and going and uh it might it might be that at one moment you might stop creating thoughts but it's not that you didn't. You have the illusion of creating thoughts because the thought of not having thoughts is a thought in itself. So there you go. There you have it. It's the idea of uh, stopping the mind is also a thought. So, uh, Nirvana, to put it in, in, in plain words, it's the cessation of thought, but it should be more the clinging to thoughts, the clinging to those ideas, to whatever it is that, that, that we have about Nirvana. And, uh, and I was explaining about, in a perfect example, clean anger. Clean anger, you would be, okay, clean anger would be when, and I was giving the example, you have a, <clears throat> child, you open the door to the house and this child runs to the street and right to the middle of the street, the first thought is, it's going to get hit by a car. So you are in fear. Your reaction is to scream at the child, to stop the child from running to the street and being hit by a car. So first is the, the fear and then the fear brings out the anger. You're angered at the child because he just ran off to the street. And so you're upset and yell at the child, scream, and it's, the child stops and comes back to you. Once it comes back to you, you see that it's safe. Then that anger stops into gratitude because nothing happened to the child. That anger is gone. Now you have gratitude. The fact that the anger was there at one moment and the very next moment is not there, that's clean anger. And not, not clinging to that anger. If you're angry at that moment, you are. The moment you're out of it, that's it. It's not even worth it. Think about it. It's not worth thinking about it because, you know, why cling to something that already happened? Child is safe, so don't, <clears throat> and it's the thing that many parents do, oh, he's a reckless child. And then we start getting ideas about people. And this could happen to, not just to children that we're talking about, to any, any person. That's how we form concepts about people. Oh, my friend is like this, because that's, such person does this. So we start classifying. Then we start having ideas about people. And not just people, we have ideas about situations, about life, about our lives, our jobs, about everything. So there you go, you already put a, a barrier between you and reality. So nirvana is just being with what it is. Being what you, whatever you have in life, that's what it is. It doesn't mean that 
things are good or bad. And uh, uh, I think a uh, wrong concept that we have about life is when we say, I'm going to live life. And we have this concept that we're going to live life and we're going to just enjoy life. And we have, oh, life is just good moments. Enjoying life, living life to its fullest is just living its, its good moments. Well, that's not what life is. Life come with, comes with good and bad moments. And per se, you could classify them as good or bad. I would classify them as things work or don't work. Something happens to you, of course you're gonna have a, 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 a problem. Is it a problem or is it a situation? You decide. So, <clears throat> life is never gonna stop. Never, ever. You might attain the highest level of uh, understanding and yet life is not going to stop. Buddha himself, you know, he remembered when he got upset with his monks because they started bickering and arguing against each other. And at one moment he just got fed up and said, that's it, and he left. From what I understand, he left for apparently years. He just disappeared and left them by themselves because he just couldn't handle them. And we're talking about Shakyamuni Buddha, and he left them. So it doesn't mean that life is going to stop. It's just how you react to it. It's how you react, not to life, but to your understanding of it. Something happens, and you think it's happening to you. It is happening. Of course, it's in your life. But the deed itself, it's not the deed itself, it's how you react to it, how you act upon it, how you make it to be. Therefore, optimism, you know, it might sometimes be so hard to be optimistic, but it's not that we don't have the capability of being optimistic, it's just that we don't have the capability of letting go of our pessimism. Because it's just the same, it takes the same effort to be pessimistic as to be optimistic. It's just a choice that we have to make. And how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> I would say meditation, get a clear mind, start letting go of our ideas or our concepts of, of how things are. And so this morning we were talking about it and how uh, uh, Nirvana, it's often understood as somewhere we're going to go when we die. But Nirvana itself is, is just here. It's just that space. And you know now the famous the power of now. It's just that. It's just being in the now. Just being in, in, in what it is as it is. It's not that things are hard to understand. Is that our understanding of things, it's hard to let go of our ideas or beliefs. And, and if you look, everything is a belief. Everything. We were talking about this morning how uh, you might attain a level of understanding, and now you start, oh, I understood such and such. I have the concept of nirvana. And then you start creating a thought process to process reality. So then your concept, you try to apply your concept of nirvana. Oh, nirvana is having no thoughts, no attachment to anything. And then you, there you go. Again, another belief. Now it's, so you didn't really have, a, a, you had an awakening, but you turn it now into a belief. So those awakenings that we call them Kenshus, it's just also, you have them and you let go. You have them and you let go and you don't cling to them per se. Now I have an understanding, understanding of this. And then there you are. Oh, now I know how life works. No. <laughs> so we keep creating concepts and then even the concept of Nirvana can become a concept. And there we go start again. Creating processes, creating methods to process life because that's all we, we, we just want to understand life. We just want to understand ourselves, how we work, how life works. But 
how does life work? I don't know. I wish I had an answer. All we can do is just face it. And life is, I always thought that life is like a, a, a train and you're in the middle of the riddle. Either just step aside and watch it or stand in front and try it. Try it all, you know, oh, stop it. What's going to happen? You're not going to stop it. Because we might think, oh, I'm a strong and I'm going to fight like, we're going to die. Either way, at the end, we're going to die. And if we look at that concept of that, we understand, well, you know, and it's not, again, it's not that it's void, it's emptiness. As, oh, well, anyway, why should I make any effort if I'm going to die? Well, you can look at that like, okay, yes, you know, I'm going to die. So, not why make any effort, but rather, why suffer? Why suffer? Why, why do we choose to suffer over things that honestly have solutions? Or they might have, but we don't find it. So why suffer over something that at this moment you don't have answers? So that's how we go. We go through life, you know, trying to, to understand things and then always creating and, and adding up beliefs upon beliefs upon beliefs. And, and Buddhism, Zen, Dharma becomes another belief. So the practice of the Dharma would be to attain that ultimate stage, it would be just to to be, be there, be there. And it's not itself understanding nirvana or the concept of it, but rather living that concept. You can read all the books you want. I mean, you could, I know people that, that are excellent scholars that can quote any any master or any phrase or any sutra and yet Buddha meant for us to experience Shakyamuni Buddha what he was saying is you have to experience it remember when he was uh, about to enter the par nirvana and they asked him what is the last uh, advice you could give us and he said do not believe anything even if I say so he has to click, per se, with you. He has to, you have to have some resonance with it, whatever it is. Even if it's a, 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 a Buddhist concept, if it doesn't resonate with you, you don't have to believe it. It doesn't mean that it has some sort of truth in it. It's just that at this moment you don't understand it because your understanding of it is not, is not there yet. You know, like when we read the Lotus Sutra, I, who, I don't know who was in the classes, T, uh, Padahai, I don't know you ever were in those classes. You read the Lotus Sutra and you're like, what are they talking about? All these beings and all these assemblies and Shravakas and, and remember and the Kalpas and something that your mind doesn't grasp. But it doesn't mean that there's no truth in it. <clears throat> It's just that at um, this moment we're not there. So if it the, even if it's the Lotus Sutra and it could be the ultimate truth, yet at this moment we do not resonate with it, we don't have to accept it or believe it or practice it. It's only through understanding yourself and your capabilities. And once you apply the Dharma, the teaching, the Buddhism, Zen, whatever, it is that we call this practice only when you apply it is that you start seeing some sort of I guess relief relief in, in, in the, that anguish <clears throat> that, that suffering that we have which is what Shakyamuni said it's not about life is suffering it's more life is dissatisfaction because we might be doing excellent in life and have no problems whatsoever of any kind but then yet, okay, well now I don't have any problems there. The fact that you don't have any problems becomes a problem. And then we start worrying, oh, you know what? I don't have any problems. 
oh, how come I don't have any problems? And then it becomes another issue. So just being there, being there with what it is, what most importantly with ourselves. I think that's I I, I think that the fact that we don't we can't be here now is because we don't know how to be with ourselves. We're always chasing out something. A thought, a feeling, worry. And we're always escaping. So it's not that they that we don't we're not capable, like I was saying, but it's the fact that we don't know how to be with ourselves. And therefore loneliness. You might be amongst thousands of upon thousands of people and feel lonely. Or be in the center of LA and feel lonely. Or you could have a wonderful family and feel lonely. Or you could be here in the middle of nowhere and feel that everybody is with you because you have the capability of being with yourself. So, loneliness doesn't exist because you're with yourself all the time. You are just, it's, you know, me and myself. Like we were talking about this morning and I think I've thought about it. I, I mean, I've talked about it. Reality operates against the background, movement of operates against the background of stillness. If you look at a tree, and you see the, the, the wind stops blowing the leaves, the tree might look still. So then you realize that there's movement because there's a stillness. So the backdrop of movement is a stillness. So they in an inner tangle and one gives rise to the other. Just like, you know, uh, uh, Buddha said, you know, the, the thought gives rise to, to what we see. So, being with ourselves, being with ourselves, being just there for us, you know, that, and the problem is that we treat ourselves like we treat other people. So we treat other people like we treat ourselves and then we treat ourselves like we treat other people. It's just the same thing. It's one or the other. There's nothing out there. There's no other I. I mean, there's no you. It's only other I. Because all of you and myself have the exact same processes. It's just that we have different identities. So we all have the same processes, thought processes, but different personality, what does that make? We all are one consciousness. The same consciousness that is in you, is in me. But then in me arises as me, and it arises in you as you, and then it arises in you as you, and your story of yourself, the story that you have created about yourself, the way you were raised, the problems that you had to endure in life to become who you are, which were not the Buddha mechanism to understand, to survive. It's just the mechanism to survive that biology, biology does. That's how we become. So it's there. The consciousness is in all of us. We all have the same consciousness, just arising in different personalities. And that's all. So when you understand that, when you understand that the other is the same as you, it's just the same, you, it's you in another body. Same consciousness. It's like the blue sky. And thoughts, or the thought of yourself are like clouds, they come into consciousness. Well, all of us are that blue sky. But those clouds become the me the concept of yourself. And therefore you think that you are those, those thoughts of that identity. And you cling to it and you fight for it and you'll die for your ideas and for the idea of whom you are. And there's people, I, I love this phrase that says, 
uh, someone told me about a, a tombstone that said, I told you I was sick. <laughs> That's it. Because we fight to death for the idea of all ourselves. And we cling to that. So that's what Shakyamuni Buddha meant. Nirvana is just that, you know. Just, just, uh, uh, you know, he, he wanted to get uh, liberation from samsara, you know. And that's it. That's it. It's just, uh, uh, you know, learning to, to, to be yourself. And I think I would, I would like to think that enlightenment is nothing but understanding that, that, that consciousness is the same in every single being. And once you get that understanding, you would see that even that person that is the most despicable person in the world that has done everything that you can, can imagine that can be done against another human being, they have done it. But when you get that consciousness is in that person also, you realize that it's just ignorance. And that's what Buddha meant by ignorance. It's not that you don't, you don't have an education, it's that you ignore what you're doing. Therefore, people, we human beings keep committing crimes that you're like, how can someone do that? Well, how can they, they don't know. They're ignorant of what they're doing. That's why. So therefore they find reasons to do it because they ignore that they have the capability of making a dis distinction. So when you understand that, you're capable of having a conversation with anybody, regardless of your ideas, your party, your political affiliation, your religion, your sexuality, anything that you define yourself as, once you see that that other person, his point of view aren't as valid as yours. In your opinion, yours might be more humane, and there's not. But that's because you're making, making the distinction. But you understand that the same consciousness arises is in all of us, and then you realize that that person does not see what they're doing, it erases that gap, which is what we're suffering nowadays. We're divided. This country is divided. We, we see two factions all the time. But if we understand that the people that we're against or are against us, we're exactly we're one and the same. And once you realize that you're capable of having compassion, and that's exactly what a bodhisattva is.